Hello and welcome to the fifth of six presentations in the Nuancing National Security Lecture Series. My name is Matthew Hughes and I serve as the Executive Director of the International Relations Council in Kansas City, and we're so glad to have you with us today. The International Relations Council strengthens Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact on our community. As a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values informed civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. Whether you're joining us live or viewing the recording later, we invite you to learn more about the International Relations Council, including other upcoming events and how to join the IRC as a member on our website at irckc.org. Please take special note of the remaining program in this series on energy security. A central mandate of any national government is national security, but the responsibility involves much more than traditional military defense capabilities. Today, while balancing military and diplomacy priorities, national governments assess and combat threats in cyberspace and outer space, water supplies and power grids, food production and energy chains. In this six-part virtual series, the IRC is taking a deep dive into the national security arena, offering historical context and global perspective for core dimensions of national security and exploring the risks, priorities, and tactics on the radar of US security policy. We hope you'll engage with us today as we explore cybersecurity and infrastructure resilience. We certainly welcome your thoughtful questions through the course of the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And do check out and share the other conversations in the Nuancing National Security series as we consider a range of critical issues in the coming weeks. We're grateful to our sponsors who have made today's program and the Nuancing National Security series possible. In particular, supporting series sponsors, Buttonwood Financial Group, Garmin, Nicole Gresham Perry, and Cyprian Simkowitz and Jerry White. Thank you for finding value in these conversations. I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator for today's program, who will introduce our speaker and help us navigate the conversation. Colonel retired Peter M is assistant professor at the US Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. He received his undergrad degree in psychology at the University of Michigan and master's degrees in strategic intelligence, military arts and sciences and strategic studies from a range of esteemed institutions. He serves as principal instructor of CGSC's cyberspace operations elective, as well as a curriculum author for, this, for the college's cyberspace lessons. Mr. M's 27 year career as an intelligence officer spanned a range of tactical, operational and strategic assignments. He served at the National Security Agency in various cap capacities in support of worldwide cryptologic operations. His focus areas include the evolution of joint cyber operations, signals intelligence, information warfare, cyber policy and military planning and strategy. He worked on cyberspace scenario development as part of Army Capability Development and served as a doctrine reviewer for the US Army's Cyber Center of Excellence. Pete is a member of the University of Kansas's NSA Cybersecurity Lablet Industry Board and a supporter of KU's Intelligence Community Center for Academic Excellence. Pete, thanks so much for being here with us today. Please take it away. All right, thank you, Matthew. I, thank you, Matthew, I appreciate that. And, uh, and hopefully our connection uh, uh, stays up all evening here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Askey, who is the director of National Risk Management Center uh, as part of the United States Army, or excuse me, the United States Department of Homeland Security. Bob was selected as a Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA's National Risk Management Center in 2018 at the Department of Homeland Security. As one of CISA's assistant directors, he oversees the center's efforts to facilitate a strategic cross-sector risk management approach. To... The center provides a central venue for government and industry to combine their knowledge and capabilities in a uniquely collaborative and forward-looking environment. These activities support both the operational and strategic unified risk management efforts, which will be a part of our discussion tonight. As head of the National Risk Management Center, Bob has a responsibility to develop integrated analytic capabilities 
to analyze risk to critical infrastructure and to work across the national community to reduce risk. And as part of that, he co-chairs the Information and Communications Technology Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force and leads CISA's effort to support development of a secure 5G network. He also serves on the Executive Committee for Election Infrastructure Government and is a culmination of years of risk and resilience experience. He most recently served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary and Acting Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection, where he led the coordinated national efforts to partner with industry and to reduce risks posed by acts of terrorism and other cyber and or physical threats to our nation's critical infrastructure, including election infrastructure. Bob has served in a number of other senior leadership roles for DHS, including acting deputy undersecretary, director of the DHS's cyber force, which was responsible for implementing Presidential Policy Directive 21 on critical infrastructure security, 13636 on critical infrastructure security. He is also the former assistant director of the Office of Risk Management Analysis at DHS, where he was responsible for developing DHS's formative policies and DHS's risk management fundamentals and risk lexicon. Prior to joining DHS, he was a start two of the first public policy websites and served as managing director for intellectualcapital.com. Bob joined the federal government in 2008 after six years as a management consultant and from Harvard Kennedy School in 2002. Bob, it is an honor to have you this evening with us and I would like to open the, the, the floor to you, sir. Sure, can I do a sound check? To... Great. Um, great to be here with you, Peter. Um, I think I just realized that I need to shorten my bio because there's always a risk somebody will try to read it. Um, so suffice it to say, I've been in this business for a little while and, and appreciate that. And it, it's great to be here with the IRC. Um, I, I, love the, I love the title of your lecture series, the nuancing national security, because I think a lot of what we're going to talk about in terms of the risks facing the nation right now you know, there's a lot in the nuance, right? That there's a lot of things uh, that demand new approaches, new strategic thinking to deal with the challenges of the 21st century. Um, and and a, a, I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency. We remain the youngest agency in the federal government. We were established in November 2018, so, so we're coming up on three years. And we were established because the Congress and the President, then, then President Trump, recognized the importance of the, the cybersecurity infrastructure security mission to national security and the need to have an agency focused on that, which, which obviously dovetails nicely to, to what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, I'm joined, um, although, although he will not be um, presenting with me, I am joined on, on this screen by Phil Kirk, who is our regional director for Federal Region 7, Assistant Regional Director for Federal Region 7, which is based in Kansas City. And Phil wanted to be on because um, after I get done in terms of talking about what we're doing from a national security perspective, obviously a lot of you hopefully will be interested in, in continuing the dialogue with CISA and having Phil as a senior executive in the Kansas City area. He's a great point of contact. And so I hope everyone will get to know Phil um, over the next uh, few months. Uh, so with, with that in mind, I will shift to my remarks. Um, so, you know, what I want to talk about, not surprisingly, is uh, the strategic risk facing the nation, um, the nation's critical infrastructure, and how we look at the strategic risk and some of the strategic risk management approaches we're taking to address that risk. So, so the National Risk Management Center within CISA is one of the CISA's principal um, organizational elements. We are a planning, analysis, and collaboration center within CISA that brings together partnership with um, the federal interagency, industry, state and local governments to go after some of the biggest problems facing the nation, some of the, some of the biggest risks to our infrastructure. Uh, to do that, we, we've um, built out our risk models. And, and the way we think about risk to critical infrastructure is really around something, a concept that's known as the national critical functions. 
working with our partners from industry and government, we have defined those national critical functions, which, which are functions of government and the private sector, so vital to the United States that their disruption, corruption, or dysfunction would have a debilitating effect on national security, economic security, public health or safety, or any combination thereof. National critical functions include areas that are priority activities to defend for CISA, such as the conduct of elections, the operation of government, the operation of core communications networks, and the use of position navigation and timing services. Those are just four of the 55 national critical functions that, 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 that guide our risk management priorities. Those, those 55 functions are publicly available on our website, um, and, and they really are the outcomes by which we're managing risk against and showing that, that critical functions produced by industry and government working together um, to enable our community well-being and our economy are safe and secure um, and, and ultimately are resilient in the, the face of potential incidents. The failure of any one of these functions to operate safety and with integrity at scale presents grave national security challenges. And it's a key element of us at the National Risk Management Center to catalyze, catalyze public-private activity to ensure that these functions are secure and resilient. So with that in mind, with the goal of keeping national critical functions up and running safely and, and with integrity, um, the, uh, the, the way we approach doing our work is then trying to understand what are the things that are the biggest risks to those critical functions. And in 2021, as we're living through this year, the five areas of strategic risk that, that we really have focused on as an agency have been one, the continued challenges around the COVID-19 pandemic, and ensuring that the pandemic, well, well, you know, the pandemic continues to play out, um, that the infrastructure and the infrastructure we need is not overly stressed by COVID-related conditions. The second area of risk, of course, is cybersecurity and, and the cyber challenges. Adversaries looking to use cyberspace to attack us as a country, to attack our economy, to do criminal activity, et cetera. The third area, which very much interacts with, with cybersecurity, is supply chain security, and particularly the security of our information and communications technology supply chain, so that we have trustworthy componentry enabling the digital revolution and we're not introducing new risk into the systems. The fourth area of, of strategic risk that, that is getting more attention, both at the department and, and at CISA, is around mis, dis, and malinformation, the information environment that we that we live in, where adversaries plus the combination of uh, factors going on in, in, in the political world are creating a very complex information environment, which makes it difficult to understand risk and to manage that risk. And then the fifth strategic risk, which, which clearly over long term is going to have really challenge the nation's infrastructure is climate change and, and related input impacts. Um, from, from weather events that, that can be linked to climate change for, from overall climate instability, which is um, something that's weakening areas of our infrastructure. And, and so with those five strategic risks in mind, let me stop, let me, let me for a second stop on each one of them and talk about kind of how we think about those risks and then where I think there's some priority approaches to risk mitigation that, that we could take to address them. So around the pandemic, um, it's, it's still true that nothing threatens the function of our institutions and infrastructure right now more than conditions surrounding the pandemic. Whether there's the ability of essential workers to work safely, the availability of critical medical resources and commodities to support COVID treatment, or the economic resilience necessary to address loss of taxpayer revenue and shortages of demand, we need a concerted effort to beat the virus by getting people vaccinated and continuing to advocate for individuals to take the risk serious. Seriously, while well, calling for communities to prioritize return to operations of key functions safely, um, you know we've we've made progress over the, over the last several months in, in getting communities and economies going again, um, in, in the face of still what is a, a public health crisis. But but we need to make sure that we're prepared for any any direction that the pandemic may take, that the disease might take over the, the coming months. Let's let's hope we're on headed in the right directions finally, and, and we will break this. But, but we need to be prepared. The second strategic risk that we talk about, that, that again is, is probably top of mind for CISA, is uh, dealing with cyber attacks. Uh, well, well, you know, we obviously have the pandemic going on. We also see what is a, pretty much an epidemic of cyber attacks, particularly ransomware against entities that are that that are entities that host critical services to include state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. 
Uh, ransomware has also this, this year had significant impacts on critical infrastructure. In particular, you know, we, we all lived through and watched the Colonial Pipeline ransomware incident where on the Colonial Pipeline IT systems and uh, hitting the ability of the, the, the pipeline in Colonial to do business then had an impact on operations and their operational technology and ultimately the running of the pipeline, which cascaded down across the, the supply chain and availability of fuel and ended up with some pretty significant real world impacts. Um, another uh, critical infrastructure ransomware attack that, that got a lot of attention to us was, was the attack against the JBS food facility and, and JBS food, which, which impacted, you know, it was an international attack, but ended up impacting meat production in, domestically here in the United States and availability of, of um, food in, in JBS to do business. These sort of cyber attacks are particularly insidious as the design is to prevent the functions of things that citizens and businesses rely on for purposes of profit. But ransomware is not the only cyber risk, unfortunately. Nation state adversaries have even gone further and put critical functions at risk for their own geopolitical aims and continue to illegitimately threaten America's national interests. Peter, I'm sure you, 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 you recognize that and, and you know that from your past experience in, in some of what you're following, but, but we have not seen the worst case for what a nation state can do to us via cyber means. And CISA working as part of the overall national defense effort has to take seriously and get the information out to the industry to take seriously the threat from adversaries via cyber means. So, so that's a second strategic risk area. Third area that's top of mind for me is supply chain exploitations. In the Homeland Security community, the term solar winds has become a household name. The, the software where there was a software supply chain attack earlier this year or at the end of last year. While it is tempting to focus on the company whose software was breached, the more important thing to remember is the vector which allowed the attack. Highly trained actors associated with the Russian government use the software supply chain and associated software management to add and exploit vulnerabilities into critical administrative operations, which enabled access to critical infrastructure held by the critical information held by the US government and others. These sort of supply chain exploitations, as well as other incidents which challenge the availability and integrity, present strategic risk to our infrastructure. That Peter mentioned in his intro to me, the supply chain task force that I co-chair with it, with industry reps. In that task force, we identified more than 200 significant threats to information and communications technology supply chain, threats that, that have to guide um, supply chain risk management efforts. Uh, fourth strategic risk, the malinformation environment. The ugly mess of information questioning the integrity of the 2020 election and the legitimacy of our government is just one example of the risks associated with mis dis and malinformation. From a homeland security perspective, it is imperative that bad information isn't used to incite extremism or radicalization and also doesn't prevent measures taken to advance national interests such as broad vaccination and continued enhancement of communications networks to enable an innovation. Foreign adversaries have pushed false narratives to those effects and they are being augmented by um, radicals in the domestic space. And then the, the final risk that, that we're focusing on is climate change. Uh, one of the first things President Biden did upon being um, sworn in was to uh, sign an executive order where he noted that climate change remains a national security issue and that the linkage between climate change, um, that it's important to understand climate change from a national security perspective. The linkage between climate change can be seen by the unprecedented wildfires and hurricanes we have seen, and we, we've seen that this year, um, you know, a continuation of trends over the last several years. Uh, so unusual weather patterns and intense natural disasters threaten the infrastructure that, that provide essential service to the American public. Ongoing and future changes to the climate have the potential to compound risks and have a major impact on critical infrastructure. So, so those are the five uh, risks that, that guide our work in the National Risk Management Center. A lot of our areas, a lot of our focus is on analyzing how those risks can play out and potentially impact national critical functions, as I talked about. Um, those risks, of course, are not in, in isolation, and the combination of them just creates a, an augmented risk environment. So, so you know, we, we do live in a period where our nation's infrastructure is in a period of heightened risk, uh, but that's not a reason for pessimism. We can take on this challenge and really through the kind of public-private conversations we're having in a setting like this, we can hopefully as a country um, elevate our focus to deal with the issues challenging infrastructure today. We need to really focus on 
building out a capabilities-based approach with flexible governance and the ability to assemble and combine knowledge, authorities, and investment to, to address the strategic risks facing the nation. So, so uh, let me end by just highlighting three areas where the National Risk Management Center is working as part of that effort to implement a flexible, adaptive capabilities approach. These are three capabilities that are really important to, to build out and really are the areas where we're making investment at as a center as part of CISA. One is enhancing foresight. The second is improving infrastructure analysis. And the third is focusing on co-solutioning. CISA really is trying to take a longer term approach to thinking about how to secure tomorrow and push out smart risk management solutions. It's hard to effectively address incidents unless you have the foresight to imagine what those incidents could be and invest in planning and resilience beforehand. Many of you who I'm speaking to here represent businesses who do that kind of capital planning. And it's really important to think in terms of longer term, in terms of planning resilience for, for the critical things that you do. And for us at CISA, for the things the country do, does. That means security by design, serious efforts for continuity planning and exercises, building for the future and not the present, and arranging contingency contracts and excess supplies for critical needs. As part of our effort, we are building out a Secure Tomorrow toolkit, which will help communities anticipate shocks and work through the needed capabilities to address those. This toolkit is the kind of thing that you can work with CISA regional offices to tailor it for the needs of, of different communities. Thinking longer term, applying foresight is part of good business now. But of course, foresight needs to be augmented by science. One of our core projects at the National Risk Management Center is to build out the risk architecture to allow us to understand how national critical functions are produced and what puts their ability, availability at risk at a national scale. We're building out a risk architecture that is a technology enabled tool, which includes a decomposition of critical functions with data on important subfunction systems, networks, assets, and enabling technology and components to help us prioritize the most critical things that need additional attention to, for security and investment in security and resilience. And then the final area um, where we're working within the NRMC is around the idea of co-solutioning. So much of Homeland Security is tied up in building collaboration. Think terms like public-private partnerships and information sharing. And one of the reasons we were created at the National Risk Management Center was to have folks work shoulder to shoulder to work through the biggest problems in the nation. Think about the five risks I laid out at the beginning of my remarks. Which of these problems would you be com comfortable in government solving by itself? On the other hand, which of these can be solved without government involvement? The truth is that solutions are best when they match the capabilities, authorities, and market energy that come with government and industry collaborate, collaborating. The challenges are too big to be stovepiped and the talent too diffuse. We need new approaches to governance to develop solutions. So, so I'll stop there, Peter. Um, and hopefully leave um, and on, on you know the optimistic note of we need to come together and work hard to go after the challenges that are being presented by the kind of risks I laid out. This is a crucial moment in, in the nation's history. We are seeing infrastructure that is at, as much at risk as it has been since 9-11, is as much at risk as it's been since after the World War II period. We need investment in the country. We need investment in our capabilities. We need smart thinking, smart planning. We need to come together to push innovative solutions so, so that we can continue to live the promise of America and the, the economy of our, our communities. So, so I look forward to the discussion and, and thanks for having me again. Well, that, was, that was excellent. Um... Wow. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to jump right into it. You know, among all of the things that you're dealing with right now, especially um, in the space of the, the incentivization of the private sector, I think is probably the thing that uh, comes to mind uh, and making security become a, a core tenet of, of how the private sector uh, moves forward. You know, what has been some of the best practices or at least what are the things that are, are, are currently underway that are, uh, that are helping us get better? Sure, so, you know, I, I start to answer that question with making sure that security and security decisions and risk are baked, baked into business practices and business decision-making. And you, you talked a little bit about, about incentives you know, we start with the idea and, and anyone who runs a business knows that if your business goes offline for whatever reason, you're losing money, right? You're losing, you're losing revenue there. 
Um, we, we at CISA work hard through our regional offices and other to get the best available information about how risks could present themselves to businesses in the hands of, of business decision makers so that they can take that into account in making decisions. That starts with things like take your cybersecurity risks seriously, understand what it is that are the critical processes that you rely on digitalization that can be undermined um, by, by cyber means. It, it also starts by taking seriously who you do business with, whether it's your, your managed service provider, your cloud service provider, um, whether it is the, the key hardware and software that are on your systems, know that, know the interaction, write into contracts as much as possible, do as, as you evaluate companies you're doing business with, understand understand whether those are new sources of risk and, and put demands, you know, trust, trust but verify on, on who you do business with as, as part of acquisitions processes. And then, you know, finally, and I mentioned this a little bit in terms of having plans and exercises, test, 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 stress test yourself. Um, that's part of good contingency planning, part, part of good understanding, but, but, but have a plan in place in case you know, in case any of these risks hit themselves. And, and so those are, those are some of the best practices. You know, we, we try to make our simple ways to, to put, get information, put tools in place to support planning and contracting and, and testing and exercise. We try to make that available, but, but, but really security has to be part of good business at this point. Well, excellent. I totally agree. Um, in terms of the, the trend lines that you've seen, and at least in terms of from, from a Homeland Security standpoint, uh, what do you think are, are the areas that we need to spend more time on? Especially, you know, you laid out some great five areas of risk, but, you know, and none of them are all the same. But, you know, in this point in time, what is it that uh, you see or you see as kind of the emerging areas that we've got to, to really make some progress on? Yeah, I, I mean, I hate to be a broken record, but but it is know, know your suppliers, um, you, you know, is a, a key element. Know, know if there's concentration of where you get things. Again, su suppliers introduce risk into, into the way you do that. And, you know, that, 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 that's a key element of you know, managing risk because things are sort of outside of your control. If you look at the cyber incidents um, that have really dominated the headlines, it's a piece of software, a piece of hardware that impacts the functioning of a, a business, some of which, you know, are things are then exploited for, you know, we talk about ransomware, right? right ransomware is, is bad guys exploiting known vulnerabilities to take down that they see through opportunistic means to take down operations to make some money, right? And so you got to recognize that, that don't assume that you, that the businesses won't be targets of this. It may be that they're not direct targets, but the, the core enabling software and hardware might introduce adversaries who, who see them as an opportunity to, to, profit through crime or to do something else that puts puts um, communities or the nation at risk. Absolutely. Uh, Bob, we've got a question here from Miss Lynn Hamamoto from Cincinnati, Ohio. And Lynn asks, public-private collaborations mean the public funds, uh, means the use of public funds, but never become financial partners with business. Um, she asks, how is that in terms of fairness to, to taxpayers? And I guess that's one of the questions in terms of resources. Over. Sure. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, and um, I won't perhaps do it all justice. But, but the way I think of it from the taxpayer perspective is... First and foremost, in a best case world, we are giving the best available information to businesses to make informed risk mitigation decisions and to incentivize businesses to balance short term profit motives with longer term risk. You know, shareholders are a good check on that. There are other checks on that. But in the ideal world, all we would be doing in from government is giving better information to folks to make smart risk decisions. And that gets us a lot, a lot way there. Then the Chinese government gets involved or the Russian government gets involved or massive criminal elements that, that operate in, in the black and gray space get involved. And we see real impact to communities and, and potential impact to the health and well-being of our citizenry 
that goes beyond perhaps what makes good rational business decision. And, and it's that delta, which I, I talk about at risk, where there are things that even, you know, with best available information, industry can only manage risk up to a certain point. And there needs to be government and industry involvement to, to deal with the delta of adversaries who, who you know, unfortunately, we live in a, a period where, which is kind of unprecedented when American private sector is a area of target from foreign governments, from, from you know, it's always been foreign criminal groups or domestic criminal groups, but from foreign governments. And there is a need to go further than just information share because, you know, what businesses produce, the, the financial system, the, the you know, production and generation of electricity, the availability of water, things like that, the availability of vaccines, we need to work in partnership to secure that. that. The thing is, the government doesn't want to come in and, and mandate things to operate in a way that don't work in a business environment. Instead, we want to be in constant dialogue about how we can jointly work together to address the risk. And so, so from a, you know, fairness to the taxpayer's perspective, it is recognizing that national security demands, you know, defend, defending both our citizenry, but, but our, our, our business community um, in the face of the challenges we face. Bob, I think one of the challenges just kind of is, as you were speaking, I kept thinking in terms of, um, you know, from a, from a standpoint of we take, uh, it's a tragedy of the commons, you know, we, we take many, many things for granted without really realizing the underlying um, uh, infrastructure that is at play and the vulnerability of that infrastructure. Um, you know, if you, if you were to look at kind of education writ large of the populace, what can we do? I mean, obviously we're in a forum where we're, we're, we're getting some education right now this evening, but uh, in terms of maybe a slightly off top, off top of how do we increase our literacy, if you will, in understanding um, this, not only the cyber domain, but really uh, in terms of uh, a citizenry that understands the challenges that are, and the pressure that we're under. Yeah, you know, one of the things we hang our hat on at CISA is October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and that is a targeted effort by the federal government to spread the word about um, the importance of cybersecurity and that every American and then certainly businesses have a role to play in being a good digital citizen and, and what does that look like and, and, and get the word out, arm, you know, Armed third parties to help promote that messaging. So look for us to, to be, be doing a big push, particularly this October. We've got a new new director, Sissa Jen Easterly. This is, will be her first cybersecurity awareness month. She's going to have some cool ideas. You know, we, we want to push innovation, we want to push challenge co co contests, things like that. Right now we have a we have um we're about to close uh, the, I think it's our third cyber competition cup, which which we do um to to encourage more people to come in and demonstrate their cybersecurity ability and promote good good cybersecurity. So, so those are areas by which we do it. Obviously, the federal government can help stimulate um, the education system to train and educate folks on this. But, but it is certainly a, a recognition that everyone has a role to play in, in good cybersecurity, just like you know, everyone has a role to play in good emergency preparedness, you know, dealing, and, you know, I talked in my, my remarks about the importance of public health to deal with the pandemic, but then there's emergency preparedness. And, you, you know, we want to stimulate good security and resilience thinking at the individual level, or, you know, give, give tools so that, so that people can do that. And, and, you know, I do rely on you know, people who are more influential in different communities than the federal government might be, right? There are corporate leaders in all over this country. There are non-governmental organizations. There are advocacy groups that represent different constituencies. And often, you know, for better or for worse, and, you know, I'll say better for now, they're, they're maybe even a little more trusted than the federal government because they're, they're you know, on the ground with communities. And, and you know, we want, we want to encourage them to, to push the word out as well. I, don't want, I, I would also just leave it to the audience to please, as you come up with the chat, um, please don't don't hesitate. Uh, I've just got kind of a few questions here, but as as just to remind the audience, the chat function is down there, and I will I will fire away. Um, okay, so when you look at, I want to touch a little bit on resilience and um, just from a perspective 
in looking at what have we learned in terms of like with regards to understanding the dependencies and the systems that underpin our infrastructure. And I'm gonna pick on Colonial Pipeline for a minute because I felt like that was an excellent example of many, many different lessons that can come out of uh, an event. And just wanted to get your take on that, Bob. Sure. Um, so, you know, that I, I talked a little bit about remarks and I know I covered it fairly quickly about the idea of a risk architecture but, and really understand how functions interact with each other. You use the term, Peter, interdependencies. Um, as we were living through the pipeline incident, we, we recognized fairly quickly at the national level that, you know, it was as much uh, energy assurance incident as, as it was a cyber incident, right? And the, the, the instigating factor for the availability of the pipeline and then ultimately the, 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 the oil and other things that were, that were flowing through the pipeline was a cyber attack. But, you know, the real world impact was that, that you know, on the East Coast, certain supply was not available for a little while. And, you know, had this gone on for another week would, would cause real shortages. Um, at that point, we sort of activated our knowledge of, of living through the kind of planning of, of that. We recognized that there were certain airports that relied on Colonial Pipeline and the type of fuel coming out of some of the pipeline that, that could get to shortage. And you could imagine an airport shutting down, flights getting closed, and, and things spinning out of control. And, you know, what, what we did is take a number of steps to have the ability to move product to those airports through different ways to prioritize that you know, the kind of things we were doing from a resilience um, perspective where we, we were waiving transportation regulations so, so that more trucks could go um, with, with different things. We, you know, the Secretary of Homeland Security introduced a Jones Act waiver as, as sort of contingency so, so that we could rely on more shipping capacity should, should that need. The Defense Department was, was ready, again, to, to move things in a different direction. Unlike a hurricane, you know, there was no problem moving things. It was just we had to stimulate um, the ability for more more product to move, and, and we were ready to do that. We were looking to anticipate shortages, and, and so you know I think we were in pretty good shape, and I think that borne out. And then it became much more of a sort of a, a domestic retail level um, gas price issue, and, and, and a little bit of a fuel shortage dealt with with a with sort of panic buying related to that. And 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 so you know. You, you have to get into that level of resilience, particularly if this has gone longer about how to communicate, you know, that what is and isn't something to be concerned about in, in that kind of risk communications. But those were some of the, the lessons we, we took. And we, we learned those from past experiences that, that you know, anticipate how things could flow two or three steps later and, and be, in, be in front of them so, so that, you know, we're, we're at less risk. It was, it was um, quite interesting as you're watching each of the, the various things occur. And I think, uh, you know, in terms of being able to anticipate is probably a thing. And I also like something that you mentioned about forethought. Um, but before I go there, um, I have a question here from Michael Vanderpool. And uh, he asked, how much is the advice being prepared or preparations in terms of, in terms of food? energy, medical supplies, uh, et cetera, are being promoted, are still being promoted to populations, uh, whether in the larger segments or smaller segments, or probably urban or rural? And is it still part of the government security strategy when we think of uh, preparedness for disruptions or failures in cybersecurity or infrastructure? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, I mentioned Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We we love our months in the government. This is actually National Preparedness Month, um, which which within DHS means this is the month that the FEMA's got got sort of point, and you know, come October, CIS has got point for Cyber Month, and then November is Critical Infrastructure Security and Resilience Month. So, you know. It's a, it's a celebration every month here. Um, but but no, we, we are pushing that, you know, you, you see what, what's happening in, in Louisiana and, you know, there are citizens and communities that are dealing with, um, you know, down power, loss of power, power outages for more than two weeks now going on, com coming from Ida. And you know, that's an unfortunate reality and having some plans for how, how you're going to navigate that, having backups, backup capacity, you know, in this case, you know, the red 
crossed and non-governmental organizations are so crucial to to doing that at the community level and i, I think you know we, we certainly help encourage working with ngos with, with planning for, for things like that to, to arm communities and then we're we're prepared with, with um direct federal assistance um but but i think as individuals that's an important element of it you know i, I do work on some more scary scary scenarios of, you know whether adversary is doing something like an electromagnetic pulse attack or or natural occurring space weather geomagnetic disturbances that could could knock critical functions out for a while and you know it, having that kind of thinking in place is an, an important and and something you know that certainly that that we we push recognizing again that there is affordability issues that there you know you you can't you can't be ready for everything and, and reasonably plan for things that are highly unlikely to happen but 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 i think as, as a whole community we have to do do a little bit of that i think um tacking slightly differently what about in terms of uh smaller communities you know we we kind of see the the bigger things but it you know the the on the news especially um you know we, we can see the urban areas but in terms of uh smaller footprints and looking at resilience from that standpoint, um, from a cyber perspective, um, and then really just in terms of the the, the idea, you know, you, you mentioned kind of this issue with uh, with reference to resources, and, and I think in terms of, of just simply dollars here in Lansing, there isn't a lot, you know, Lansing, Kansas is not that many dollars to be able to build out. You know, where's kind of in your take, kind of the the government side, or at least from from CSIS perspective, in terms of being able to help us. Uh, prepare for this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, without going into the particulars, and I'll let Congress decide what's in an infrastructure bill, and it isn't. But, but you know, part of that element of, of the infrastructure bill is an investment in security and resilience of communities, and you know, we'll we'll see what what passes. But that puts a lot of opportunity. You know, within that, there's cyber grants for small and local communities that CISA would be administrating. Administrating there is. Um, money associated with water cyber security there's money associated with energy cyber security um there's it modernization funds that sort of stuff so so it's a combination of cyber security funds plus it systems modernization and investments there so, so that that certainly has a beneficial would be beneficial you know our job at, at, at CISA would be to administrate that in a way that it is you know would promote community's ability to buy down some of the risks there. Um, you know, small communities, we've been particularly concerned about ransomware attacks on, on hospitals and, and school systems, which you've seen all across the, the, the um, all across the country that that's why we've invested more in having community level representation field level representation um, to support some of those communities work through the, those issues um, there connect to get the best available tools that the federal and state governments have to, to support them there. Um, I don't want to diminish the risk, you know, at all, all kinds of levels, but but I, I think some of what we need to do in addition to pushing more money into the system, which will help make smart investment is, is make some of our guidance a little more approachable. Um, later this week, you know, you didn't ask about small, medium sized businesses, but 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 that's, you know, an analog to what you're saying. Later this week, we're going to be producing document to help small, medium-sized businesses do better supply chain risk management that's tailored directly for those businesses. So look for that coming out on our website. Yes, most definitely. I, I think that's that's one of the areas where when we look at uh, vulnerabilities and we never really think about the mom and pop uh, stores or just in terms of the, the impact, you know, we, we, we see that. Um, again, I just put it out to the audience. If you have questions, feel free, please, to, to chime in on chat. Um, in terms of the, the challenges between the, the man-made threats to infrastructure and the natural threats that we've seen like fairly recently, um, in your opinion, you know, um, is, 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 is there one that poses a greater challenge than the other when we start dealing with it from from CISA's standpoint in terms of the challenges? And you know, uh, and I probably will break it. The difference between, for example, dealing with a hurricane that takes out infrastructure on one side that uh, that may be uh, you know dealing with industrial control systems, et cetera, and then uh, hacktivists or hacker groups, excuse me, or something like that. I mean, between the two, is uh, 
you know, in terms of security and playing defense, is there one that plays a greater challenge than another? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the reason I laid out the five risks the way I did is, you know, we're, we're thinking about all five of those and, and associate things. I, I mean, still the, the number one job of the, well, maybe not the number one job, but one of the top jobs of the federal government that comes from the constitution is provide for the common defense and, you know, protecting our infrastructure from adversaries who are actually going after it for their own, for what I would call geopolitical purposes. But that's a, a real concern of ours. Um, and then you talk about this in your work, uh, but we've seen too much evidence that that um, foreign governments are, are, you know, thinking about infrastructure as a, as a target set. You mentioned control systems. You know, the president recently issued a national security memorandum focused on um, enhancing industrial control system cybersecurity, particularly in the um, electricity pipeline, water, and chemical sectors. And so, so you know, while I hesitate to say that's a bigger risk than some of the natural hazards you, you talk about. Certainly there are, there's a whole range of consequences that, that scale differently that, than um, some of the, 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 you know, natural disasters and hazards that are linked to climate change. That being said, as my colonial pipeline example, I, I hope pulled out, you know, it's, it's our experience in understanding risk to the pipeline from storms that helped us manage risk from, from a cyber attack. And so a lot of the investment on uh, and resilience doesn't have to be focused on one versus the other. It can be focused on con you know, continuing, continued functioning of infrastructure and having backup plans to um, deliver critical functions. An excellent point that that it is very true in terms of the mitigation, well, the, the response and then eventually the mitigation. Um, and I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but like your own, um, in your own dealings with perhaps um, other nations or internationally, since we're in an IRC forum, uh, is there anybody out in terms of our, our, our partners, our, our national level partners that are out uh, in other countries that um, either really have this about right or in some cases may not be, or are we kind of, I mean, just kind of a little bit of a comparison here. I just wanted to see if you had a perspective. Um, it's it's not a compare it's not a compare better or worse but but you know a couple places that that we particularly three, three groups of countries or countries that we, that we look at one you know Australia faces a lot of the same challenges in Asia from but but they have things that are unique to their geography plus sort of the the dominance of China in, in their market even more than us and having a little bit less ability to stay wholly isolated. And, and Australia's um, done a good job of, of pushing um, the envelope in terms of critical infrastructure information sharing and putting in place requirements to ensure critical infrastructure can function, deal with some of the supply chain and foreign investment concerns. Um, Jen Easterly, I mentioned she's our new direct director. Her first international trip when she got here a couple of weeks ago was to um, the United Kingdom, the National Cybersecurity Center in the, the United Kingdom is really an active collective defense center between parts of the UK government and the private sector. And we really like the NCS model. They've been a good partner with us. What we're learning in CISA of work that, that NCSC does. Um, we just announced the establishment of a joint cyber defense collaborative, which really brings industry and government together to actively work toward collab collective defense, similar to the NCSC model. And then, you know, another area where we're seeing a real all hazards of emergency management blended with national security perspective is, is from Sweden and Finland, you know, in, in the back door of dealing with some pretty significant weather type incidents, plus the, the Russian influence and in the information environment, you know, is even more acute if the Russians trying to mess with their information environment related to that and some of the challenges of having Russia's neighbor. So, you know, when I go globally and talk to folks, those are, those are some folks, some, some perspectives. I actually um, co I chair, pardon me, an OECD organization, Economic Operation Development High Level Risk Forum, where we, where we have practitioners in about two dozen of the OECD countries come together to talk about these sort of risks and strategic approaches to risk management. No, you know what? It's funny as you're speaking. I'm just kind of making a note, and 
uh, you know, in, on, the, on the national security side, we're very concerned with our adversaries, our major adversaries of uh, Russia and China. And it just seems very, you know, make total sense in terms of uh, our partners. Uh, I have another question here from uh, Lynn. And she asked, uh, doesn't it seem to you that uh, most, if not all of these risks basically evolve from the degradation or disregard uh, of, of, uh, of natural, of, of nature in order for us to enjoy commerce, or in other words, not putting enough energy and effort into uh, maintaining and upgrading infrastructure? Yeah, I, I think there is um, wisdom in, in, in that, that, you know, at some point we recognized that understanding risk was more about understanding ourselves and trends in ourselves, trends in technology, trends in, trends in commerce, tr trends in where infrastructure goes, figuring out that the adversaries would catch up with where they perceived vulnerabilities related to that and, and, and clearly weather impacts will catch up with areas where we, we haven't built strong enough to, to deal with these things. And so understanding that, that you know, what, what I don't want to apply in that answer, right, is, is trends towards digitalization, trends toward more global connection and, and commerce. I, I think they're inexorable. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of good there. So just because they present new risks and introduce new risks into the environment doesn't mean that, you know, that they're not, that they're things that need to be reversed. What it does mean is they do create new, new sources of risk and, you know, particularly you can go too far of not getting out in front of some of those sources of risk. And, and I think one of the things, you know, post the pandemic, um, you know, we, we talk about a little, you know, we, we stretched a lot of our supply chains toward Asia pretty significantly. If you, if you layer on concerns with our relationship with the Chinese and some, some of the concerns about technology being produced in, in, in China and, and other parts of that, you know, we, we allowed that all to happen as a country and as an economy thinking that, you know, the economic factors that drew that to it, you, you know, you know, for better or worse, it was allowed to happen without, without, and then we're all dealing with the consequences of, of that happening. You saw with the pandemic, you know, let's not call it an adversary risk, but, but still, you know, that over-reliance on, on Asia put our supply chains at risk, you know, had real impact on, you know, with, with commerce stock, had real impact of our ability for businesses to continue, potentially continue manufacturing and us to control our own destiny. And building some, some diversity in our supply chains, reshoring some things, stimulating manufacturing, um, entering into relationships with more trusted countries that are producing our, our digital technology. That's all part of a post-pandemic strategy and using the, the levers of, of the federal spend and, and R&D and federal investment to create a place where, where there's less first order risk because, because we're thinking about it. I, I think that's one of those classic um, national security level policy challenges, sort of thinking about economic policy, economic st stimulus, geopolitics, and national security together trade together rather than just allowing things to happen and then say, oh, we'll figure out how to secure secure the future without anticipating or trying to shape the future so it's more secure. You know, I think that's, that's spot on. One of the things as you're you're speaking, I just made a note of, you know, the, the role of, you know, major bodies. So, you know, we talk about the National Security Council, but oftentimes we tend to forget how that is so tied together with the National Economic Council and how, how, uh, how, uh, we have to look at that. I want to touch on, a, uh, I think, and again, if there are any other questions, please uh, put it in the, in the Q and A. But uh, ah, okay, here we go. <laughs> Jumped right ahead. Here we go. So this question is from uh, from D Black, and it's asked, "Can you speak to cybersecurity in the financial sector and the financial markets in terms of uh, how are we doing and kind of what is uh, going on there?" Sure. So, so the, you know, the, the number one thing that is, you know, I shouldn't say that, the, the financial markets got a, got a wake up call with Iranian activity at the start of the last decade, where we, we saw sort of coordinated Iranian um, activity against some of the, the big banks, not ultimately didn't 
impact our financial integrity, but but certainly it was a scare. The 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 money and resources that are being poured in to from the big financial institutions um, to do cybersecurity, to share cyber information, to to stress test the system, I think is pretty impressive. And you know, a lot of what we've been talking about is sort of you know, risk is created by lack of investment and lack of attention. So to the degree that that's true, you know, the big financial institutions do not have the problem of lack of investment and lack of attention towards cybersecurity. And so I think that's an important element. Um, shifting to focusing a little more on fi fintech, financial technology, and some of the, the technologies that, that underpin the financial system. So it's not just about doing that, the supply chain concerns is a pivot they're going to make. Um, the financial institutions, you know, through the Secretary of Treasury and, and the Treasury Department do an exercise series called the Hamilton series, where, where they're really stress testing financial markets. Um, so, so, you know, I start with the element that, that you know, you know that it's giving a lot of attention you know the the other element of course is having an ability to operate and, and keeping things from spinning through the markets and have ability to communicate in the face of things not working so that financial markets don't panic and so communications is a, is a key element there um i would say from from our perspective we've got to stay focused on, on the systemically important financial entities making sure they have good cybersecurity and cyber practices in place but but in a lot of areas, it's more the dependence, what they rely on, that that's more at risk than them themselves. Okay, um, I have a follow up and uh, from Deep Black. Um, do you have any concern about cyber currencies? And the example is uh, El Salvador and the promulgation of its well, its its embrace of Bitcoin. But I guess that's kind of going back inside of this. Uh, this piece in terms of advancing technologies and uh, if, if you see any issues or you see some concerns that are gonna be associated with that. Um, concern is not maybe the right word, but, but again, anticipating how that's gonna change the nature of risk. Um, is you know a big big part of what we do with the NRNC set. So well, you know, again, there's sort of a little bit of an inexorable march to more digital currency and, and things like that. And you know, making sure that again it's been designed in and it also can't be exploited by criminals in a, a different way. Of course, part of the ransomware problem is it is easy for criminals to do business with alternative sources of currency in a way that it wouldn't be if they were just exchanging dollar bills. And so, you know, we, we the trends made ransomware more favorable to the criminals and we, we need to reverse that. Um, so so that, that's a kind of example of that. Well, Bob, thank you very, very much for um, what a, a great uh, set of interactions. Oop, I think uh yep a great set of interactions i think i'm at time here and i need to turn this back over to matthew hughes please bob and pete thank you so much uh, for a really important look at some issues that have a lot of overlap in the venn diagram bob as you laid out very well tonight um, and are certainly timely in a number of different ways for us uh, not just in terms of this series but in terms of what we're seeing around the country and around the world so thank you both so much uh, for being with us tonight we really appreciate it thanks matthew and peter thanks for the conversation. Um, good luck in the rest of the series and, and appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And uh, Phil, it was great to have you on as well. Uh, we'll certainly encourage folks to get in touch with you uh, in the Kansas City area as they have interest in and needs to connect with your agency. Thank you very much. Look forward to that and uh, appreciate being uh, afforded the opportunity to sit in tonight and uh, look forward to some more interaction. Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks to all of you at home or work or wherever you are for joining us for this installment of the uh, Nuancing National Security Series. We do invite you to visit us online at irckc.org to find out about the rest of the series and other upcoming programs through the International Relations Council. Until we see you next time, we hope you stay well and we'll see you very soon. Thanks so much. <laughs>